Good morning, everyone. I would like to invite Wes and Susie up here first. It's been a um, crazy couple of months with COVID and everything and virtual church and et cetera. And we just wanted to let you know how much we appreciate everything you do for us. And so we have a little gift amidst all the craziness of collecting. <laughs> but we just wanted to have a prayer over you before I give the congregational prayer. Lord God, we just thank you so much for Wes and Susie, and we just ask that you really bless their hearts and their family and their lives with your presence, with your strength, and with your help in guiding this church. We just ask that they um, really can lean on you and you can be really present in their lives. Lord, we just also um, just pray for the health of their new baby. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, yeah. All right, congregational prayer. Um, our um, Bible study on Wednesday night is doing a book called When Changing Nothing, Changing Changes Everything. And uh, the first section of the book talks about the Lord's Prayer. And she wrote a different prayer in here. In um, It's the Lord's Prayer, but in different words. And so I thought I would uh, say that prayer today. So bow with me as we pray. Creator of all, you see more than we can see. We acknowledge that you are God and we are not. May you dwell inside us so we want what you desire. Help us remember the world looks different from your vantage point than it does from ours. Give us what we need today and help us lean on your provision for tomorrow. May we experience your forgiveness so we can extend forgiveness to others. Guide us through all temptation and rescue us from all evil. And help us to know you hold all things including our lives, in your hands. Amen. Good morning. Yeah. Please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. In the Pew Bible in front of you, it's page 678. For those of you joining us on Facebook, it looks like we got our technical issues um, uh, worked out. Um, the biggest technical issue was having somebody here who knows what to do. Uh, and so thank you, John Pratt, uh, for knowing what to do and doing it, and Vivian too. And John, if you, um, if you all want to sit out here, you can. Just set the camera on the, on the wide angle for me. Okay. Uh, you can sit out here. All right. Last week, uh, we got into really the, the, first, uh, ser- the first section of the Sermon on the Mount. And, you know, this, when I think about the Sermon on the Mount, um, th- there's, there are several different ways to look at it. Uh, is it just Jesus just teaching the twelve? It could be the passage at the beginning of the passage. It could be him just teaching the 12 disciples. Uh, it could be him teaching thousands of people. There are certainly times when he taught thousands of people. Is this just one sermon? Is these, these, uh, three, these three chapters, is it just one sermon? Or, or to me, it almost seems like surely he spoke about these things for, for days. Okay, So we have a snippet. So like last week, it's all about hatred in your heart giving... Uh, bringing forth murder, finally manifesting itself in murder. Uh, and he's and also talking about um, uh, him fulfilling the law and about being salt and light. Are those separate sermons for different occasions? Or did he really just give this little snippet? I, I, I almost feel like he must have been in, in one place for a week on this mountainside. If he's, if he's teaching throngs of people, uh, teaching these things for days at a time, and we just have little snippets of it here. Um, and then, of course... Whenever my, my own observation is that whenever I'm studying a passage and preaching a passage, uh, I I often feel like 
me or several people in the congregation get, get tested in the truth of that, that passage. I preached Job a year or so ago, and then there were several people that started going through some very difficult times uh, during uh, my preaching on the book of Job, and I apologize to them uh, extensively. I'm sorry to bre- preach this passage and then bring this upon you. Uh, last week, it's ta- we were talking about hatred in your heart, contempt for other people, and, and that finally manifesting itself in murder. I don't know, were you frustrated with anybody this week? Uh, there was lots of frustration. It's been a very trying week. And I don't care what side of the political spectrum you're on. You probably called somebody a fool in your mind. You probably had contempt for somebody in your heart uh, during this week. So you got tested. Today I'm preaching about lust. And our church's Facebook page got just bombarded with explicit images all week. It was incredible, uh, the testing that happens uh, when you just... Preach about a certain passage. Sort of like the the enemy is saying, you believe that, do you? Let's find out. Let's find out if you really believe that or not. And it exposes the sin in your heart. It exposes what is already there. You didn't know it, but it was there. And it was a worse problem than you probably thought about, uh, than you probably thought it was. But there it is. So today, um, I'm going to read this passage and then we'll... We'll start looking at it a little more in depth. Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 30. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. Lord, we read your word. Let your word read us. Holy Spirit, please be our teacher this morning. Help us to see the right perspective and convict us of sin. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 27, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And, your, uh, and if your right eye causes you to stumble, cut it off. Oh, excuse me, your right hand uh, causes you to stumble. Cut it off, throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Uh, so, uh, I don't know, how far, how far, I, I have to look at myself in the mirror sometimes and wonder, how far am I willing to go to really get sin and evil out of my life? Uh, when I read the Bible, when I see what's really in my heart and in my mind and in my life, I have to ask myself, how far are you willing to go to get this out of your life? I've been pretty open Uh, here about uh, my involvement in Celebrate Recovery and that I go because I have a tendency to overeat. I especially stress eat. uh, Or uh, I also have problems with anger. With anger. And all that goes back to when a stressor comes into my life, when something happens that I don't like, how do I react? I either get fuming mad or I say, give me something to eat to cover the pain. All right? Whatever I have to do. It's my drug. Food is my drug. Chips and salsa are my drug, and and we can laugh about it, but it's true, and it's unhealthy for me to either eat my feelings or to lash out with my feelings. So, here it is. How far would I be willing to go to get these things out of my life? Uh, Am I willing to go on strict diet and exercise? Okay, I can sometimes commit to that for a little while. I can have a few days. There was a really funny Facebook meme going around. Every time I try to go on a diet, here comes a friend's birthday or Christmas or Thanksgiving or Friday or Tuesday. I can find a reason to eat any time I want. All right? Feast days are prescribed even in the Bible. But they are feast days, not gluttony days. Not days of overeating for days and days and days and making a whole lifestyle out of it. And even in the Bible, it talks talks about there's a time to be angry. There are things that you need to be angry about. If you see corruption, lying, injustice in the world, shouldn't you be angry about that? But you don't have to go stark raving mad and lose control of yourself, do you? No, you don't. So how far would I be willing to go to get it out of my life? Would I be willing to regiment every single meal for a week? All right? Three times 21, 21 meals. Could I actually 
sit down and write out the portion sizes I'm going to have for each and every meal? Could I do that? Whew, asking a lot right there. Or when I get angry, pause, take a deep breath, count to ten. Am I willing to do that? Am I willing to just try to have a moment of pause and say, what is the right reaction here? And I don't know what your sin struggles are. I don't know what it is that you're trying to get out of your life. But if we just look at the Ten Commandments, we can maybe try to figure out just how far are you willing to go. So the first commandment is, you will have no other gods before me. All right? Now, how far are you willing to go? Are you willing to, take, uh, to remove from your life every other belief system? Are you willing to remove from your life every other safety net so that you really are relying on the Lord for every thought and every need that you have in life? Are you willing to put those other things away? The second commandment is, you will have no graven images, which is no idols, no tangible. You're not going to worship little tangible things, little idols, little statues, anything like that. So I don't know. How far are you willing to go with that? Are you willing to get rid of every single good luck charm that you've got out there? Every little thing that you think brings good luck or has some kind of power in it that's not the Lord? Are you willing to get rid of those things? Or do you say, I'll just be safe if I can hold this thing? I have even in my life uh, used the Bible, if I can just hold my Bible. And surely that can't be a sin. But am I just trusting in paper and a bound book? Or the God who inspired this book, the God who wrote this book? Do I just trust in this tangible book, or do I trust in God truly? I think it's fine to clutch your Bible, but clutch more <laughs> more strongly to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because that Bible can be taken away from you. The Lord cannot be taken away from you. The third commandment is, don't use the name of the, of the Lord in vain. Are you willing to... I've seen people, if they wanted to clean up their, their mouth, put a rubber band around their wrist and snap it, and punish themselves every time they say something they ought not to say? Are you willing to snap yourself Anytime you take the Lord's name in vain, are you willing to put a little jar up there and put put a hundred dollar bill in there every time you? No, surely a penny, but a penny well, that doesn't hurt anything. Okay, how about if you had to go find a penny? Or increasingly have very few coins in society, so maybe finding a penny. The, the trouble of finding a penny would be uh, the harder thing to do. Or what would you put? How much? Would it be a dollar? Would that not really hurt? Would it be five dollars? Now, would that start hurting? Okay, put five dollars, ten dollars in there so that you'll say, you know what? I'm going to start watching my mouth so that good, honorable speech that honors the Lord, not misusing his name, will come out of my mouth. Fourth commandment. It's remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Now, we're not really Sabbath keepers. We don't have a, a strict, uh, rigid a uh, day that you cannot work, you cannot do anything, but would you be willing to, at the beginning of your week, set out the calendar and say, this time belongs to the Lord and no other, and no matter what comes up, no matter if it's a nice day outside or not, this time belongs to the Lord, and nothing can encroach upon that time. I don't just find other things to do during that time. This time belongs to the Lord. Would you give the Lord control of your calendar? And then the fifth one, honor your father and mother. How far would you go to get that sin out of your life? The sin of dishonoring your father and mother. Would you try to reconnect after years of estrangement with them? Would you be willing to sit down and say, all right, I have to write a card this week. All right, I have to write an email. All right, I have to give a phone call. All right, I have to go by their house and fix something that's broken because they can't do it. I have to do these things to honor my father and mother, how far would you be willing to go to really observe the Lord's commandments? That's five. We'll just stop there. That's convicting enough, right? Right? Okay. Well, in our passage today, Jesus talks about taking drastic measures. And the first thing he says is, you have heard that it was said. In our, in our passage last week, he started the same way. You've heard that it was said, thou shalt not murder. And that's, of course, a quotation of the Ten Commandments. It's a quotation of Moses, the lawgiver. Uh, 
And they always called Moses the lawgiver. Of course he's the lawgiver, but where did he get it? It's not original with him. It's the Lord. The Lord is the lawgiver. Jesus is actually the Lord, the lawgiver. It's not the law of Moses. It's the law of Jesus. It's the law, the God, uh, the the law of Jehovah God, the God of the Trinity. It's His law. It's not Moses' law. And so Jesus says, "You have heard that I said." Well, I just said not that it was said that I said that Jesus Himself said a long time ago, "You shall not commit adultery." But I tell you. And don't think of that, but I tell you, as him saying, well, let's, we're going to move past that, okay? Well, let's negate that. Well, I'm going to contradict that. It's not that at all. It's more like, you have heard that it was said you should not commit adultery, but you obviously didn't get it, so let me explain it further. It's more of that kind of a tone. And he says, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You see, it goes beyond just your actions. It goes, be, goes to your heart. What did you want to do that you merely restrained yourself from doing when true righteousness is not wanting even to commit sin? Last week, we looked at murder. Uh, fine. <laughs> Jesus is saying, I'm impressed. You haven't killed anybody. Great. That's, that's wonderful. Uh, most people don't commit murder. But how much contempt do you have for another person in your heart? If your reaction is not to hate, then I'm impressed. Then you've got true righteousness. But if all you're doing is not killing people, don't, don't expect that I'm impressed with that. And here, again, with marriage male-female relationships. He says, so you're not committing adultery. I'm not impressed because you think I've been looking at your outward actions all of these thousands of years. I've actually been looking at your heart. I know what you want to do. I know what you think about doing. The fact that you didn't do it on the outside, I'm not that impressed. Not that impressed. Now, the Ten Commandments, I will tell you, um, I, and I'm going to preach about them sometime, maybe even soon. I don't know. I've thought about it for a long time. How would I preach a, a series on the Ten Commandments? The fact is, when God is setting up the Ten Commandments, he's really not just giving a list of rules uh, for everybody to follow. He's saying, this is the foundation for a stable society. If you want to have a country that endures and lasts and where people can live and flourish, you need to follow these things, these things. Uh, and I think that there's a way to preach them, even that would impress an atheist. Even if somebody was, would, did not believe in God at all, you could preach them in a way that, ever, that even an atheist would say, yeah, I th- actually think that that's probably true. I think that's probably right. I think there's probably some, uh, some truth to that. And I'm, I'm going to preach them that way. I'm going to preach them to believers, to non-believers, to atheists um, when I preach them. Uh, and I, I look forward to doing that. And maybe I'll do it sooner rather than later. Uh, But the fact is, everybody understands that if you're going to have a stable society, you have to have stable homes. You have to have stable home lives. You have to have men and women respecting each other to not just use each other and toss each other away. Everybody knows that a child who grows up with both parents there, present, in the home, is going to end up being a lot more healthy emotionally than a child who is tossed back and forth, traded back and forth. Uh, that doesn't know where they're going to spend the night tonight, okay? Everybody knows that. A lot of people, uh, when they go to therapy, they will come back out and say, it. you know, the problems are st- all started when my parents split up. My, the parent, you know, that's when the problems really started. That's when um, the distraction started. That's when my grades started to slip. That's when I started to isolate myself. That's when I started to punish myself. That's when I started to feel guilty all the time. That's when I started to blame myself for all the problems in the family. It'll all come back to that. And in the Ten Commandments, God is saying, the home is sacred. It is the first institution I set up. Therefore, it is going to be attacked by the enemy, worse than any other institution. And if you want a stable society, if a stable town, a stable family, mom and dad, have to stay together forever and we have to see extreme commitment to each other there in order for the kids to really grow up good and healthy and jesus is talking to men here 
the society uh, where he was teaching. And most societies today around the world are very much male-dominated. In his society there, women had no right to initiate divorce proceedings. They do here and now in the United States and the West. Uh, but in those days, a woman was not going to initiate divorce proceedings. It was not going to happen. Uh, so um, what happens? Why is, why is it that men uh, were, were throwing their wives away? Uh, there's actually a really interesting passage later on in Matthew in chapter 19 where some Pharisees, and this was a very controversial thing, um, and the Pharisees uh, are very rarely on the right side in the Bible. But in this uh, situation, this question, when they came up to Jesus to test him with this question, they actually, I think they were on the right side. And, uh, and, uh, and I think you can tell that by the way they posed the question. They came up to Jesus and said, can a man divorce his wife for any and every reason? That's the way they, they pose it, any and every reason. Uh, and I think if they were on the other, if they were on the side that said yes, because I think they were the side that said no, a man cannot divorce his wife for any and every reason. I think it would have been more the Sadducees or some other rabbis or whatever on the other side saying, yes, a man can divorce his wife for any and every reason. And there was this, uh, uh, this unwritten law that even if she burns your dinner, you can divorce her. Anytime, anytime she displeases you, you can find any and every reason to divorce your wife. And the Pharisees came up to Jesus and said, is that really true? And Jesus said, absolutely not. You cannot divorce your wife for any and every reason. And the significance of the passage to me, and I preached this maybe a year ago, I brought this out, that when Jesus, how strict and how much commitment he wants mom and dad to have to each other, that they cannot divorce for any, for any reason at all. God made them male and female. They're one flesh. If you rip that apart, you're killing somebody. All right? This is how strong it is in God's mind. Disciples. Listen to the disciples. Do you think the disciples were good guys? Do you think the their mind formed? Said. Maybe you of men. That is. Maybe we Jesus. Yeah, maybe you ought to. I think it, I, that's not exactly what I think he's looking at them saying, yeah, yeah, I think you probably should. If that's going to be your attitude, maybe you probably should. Now, obviously men objectify women. This is not anything new. And just think about the day and age when that was. What did everybody wear then? Togas? Burkas, something like that, headscarves. How modest did everybody dress in those days? And yet, they were still able to look lustfully. All right? And so that's the part of the disease that, you know, we live in a society where uh, some women dress fairly provocatively, fine, whatever. But I'm, not, I'm telling you, no matter where you live, no matter what society you're in, no matter how modest everybody dresses, the sin in the heart can find a way. For it to be done. I absolutely, you know that in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, on Friday night, there are some guys sitting on, the, on a car smoking a cigarette, and there's these girls with burkas going by. You obviously can't see anything at all. You hardly know that it's even a female under there, and they're probably going, I'll bet she's hot. You know? This problem, it exists even in Amish country. No matter where you are, no matter what, men can find something to say, I'll bet she's better looking than her. We can do it. And so the, the thing is, the, 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 the temptation we have, I guess, not temptation, the, the, the way we do righteousness is just to sort of hold that back, to just, mere, to just restrain that as much as you can. Just bounce your eyes, just not look, just not, you know, whatever. The, the condition of your heart needs to be changed entirely until you say, I don't look at anybody that way. I don't, I don't look to objectify. I don't look to use and discard anybody at all. And after you're married especially, this is my wife. Everybody else in the world is a sister or an aunt or a cousin or a daughter. This is my wife. She is the one that I can appreciate in that way. Her and none other. And now, of course, Jesus is talking to men in a male-dominated society um, in a society where women really have no say in who they marry and certainly can't initiate divorce proceedings. But in our day and age, let's just back that up. Let's just back it up 
and let's talk about the sin of desiring another. Because that is something that women can have a problem with. Stereotypically, women don't lust that much. I don't know if that's true or not. I've never gotten into a woman's mind to find out how much lust is really in a woman's heart. But I do know that um, desiring another, regretting who you married, flipping through the Rolodex of men in your mind saying, maybe I shouldn't have rejected him. Maybe I should have married him instead. Maybe, maybe I should have you know, flirted harder with this guy. I, wish I, really, I really wish I could have married that guy instead. Or just looking at your husband and saying, why in the world couldn't you earn more like such and such? Why couldn't you spend more time at home like such and such? Why couldn't you be better with kids like such and such? And such? Why can't you be, well, I don't know, less flatulent in bed like I'm sure such and such is? The fact is, if you're looking to nitpick looking to find any reason to get out of your situation, you can find it. It's easy. It's easy. We have to root out this desire to have another after we're married to one. Let me just go back up here. In the Old Testament, God talks about adultery a lot. He talks about adultery a lot. Uh, it's talked about in the book of Proverbs quite a bit. Um, there's a, uh, in Proverbs, it's very interesting. Wisdom is personified as a woman, as a woman, okay? And she is a woman that you should chase after with all of your heart. And then there is foolishness. And foolishness is even personified as a woman that you want no part of. And there's a very interesting passage. It's a narrative. It's a parable where this man says, I was standing on the balcony and I was looking at the street down below. Think of it like maybe Bourbon Street in New Orleans or something like that. And I saw a young fool walking down the street. I could tell he was a fool. He was an absolute moron. I knew that he was going to fall into a trap. And then down here at the other end of the street, I could see this woman. And she was dressed to the nines, perfumed. And she was coming out and looking around. And this youth comes by, this youth comes by, and she comes out and starts talking to him. And she says, my husband's away. I've just had my bath, <laughs> which <laughs> there's more into that than, than just having a bath. But uh, all of these things, and then he goes inside with her. Oh, you young fool, your life is about to be ruined. And it's, it's a literal story of things that literally happen, but it's metaphorical too, and it's spiritual that there are many seductive ideologies and gods and whatever out there that want to suck you right in. And in the Old Testament, God talks about adultery as if he himself were the jilted lover many times. Israel is his wife, and she goes out, and she runs around on him all the time. And he says, here I am, this husband at home, whose wife is running around on him. Everybody sees it. And what do you think about a man that everybody knows his wife is cheating on him? In China, they'll say, he's wearing the green hat. I have no idea what that means, where that comes from. But if, you ever, uh, if, 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 if that's happening, they'll say, well, he's wearing the green hat these days because. And he's a fool. And he is seen very poorly, very lowly. Everybody knows but you. Poor guy. What an idiot for everybody to know but him. And here's God saying, my people are worshiping other gods. They're committing adultery against me. And look at all the nations around. They look at Israel and they say, Israel is cheating on their God. Israel's cheating on their God. And how much does a fool God feel like? And he chastises for them, them for it over and over and over again. In fact, one of his prophets in the Old Testament was a man named Hosea. And he said, Hosea, I want you to feel like me. There's a, there's a woman over here. She's a prostitute. Nobody ever marries a prostitute here, and I want you to marry this prostitute. And everybody will look at you like you're, look at you like you're a fool. It's like to, to feel like me. And after she, she did, then I want you to stand up and say, Hey, Israel, in this scenario, you should feel ashamed of yourself for what you are doing to God, for how you're making God feel. You see, for God, there's no other people except his people. 
And for them, there needs to be no other God except their God. And the whole Trinity itself models this level of commitment. There's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There is no room for a fourth. They are committed to each other. And for mom and dad, there is each other. And there is no one else. There is no one else. It is a relationship that cannot be broken. Yet the interesting thing is, God's not puritanical. Uh, We obviously uh, have an overly sexualized society ourselves now. But the fact is, God actually celebrates the relationship between a husband and wife. Even the sexual relationship between a husband and wife. He wants in that relationship for both of them to flourish together, to serve each other, to lift each other up as being absolutely wonderful and beautiful. And he wants them to enjoy each other, heart, mind, soul, body, together. And he even has a whole book in the Bible sort of dedicated to it. Uh, There's a book in the Bible called The Song of Solomon or The Song of Songs. Read it, but don't read it to your children. It's really racy. And it's got a wonderful book. But some of the metaphors is kind of like, yeah, I don't know, that's kind of a stretch. And, of course, the sense of beauty changes over time. So he sort of, he, he, uh, he, he celebrates the, the roundness of her belly. Uh, mostly in our society, people don't do that. They want a nice flat stomach, right? Um, but in that one, he celebrates that part of her, okay? It's incredible, the celebration of, of, of the sexual life of a husband and wife. And it sort of goes all the way through... Uh, from being young and in love to being married later on. This is a very interesting passage to me. Uh, And I know that God celebrates love. He celebrates attraction. It just has to be committed. Look at this. Look at this. This is a weird passage to me, but let me, let me, uh, I'm going to relate it to a Beach Boys song here in a minute. Oh, I wish you were my brother. This is a girl talking to, and we suppose it's Solomon, okay? So think of Solomon maybe as a youth. Uh, Solomon really violated him, his, him, his own writing in this way because this, uh, this book is about this wonderful, beautiful, monogamous love between a boy and a girl who are absolutely enamored with each other. And how many wives did Solomon end up having? 700 wives and 300 concubines. Monogamy was not his strong suit later on, okay? But it's not because he didn't understand it, okay? So you got this, uh, this uh, boy and girl, and this is what the girl says to the boy. Oh, I, I wish you were my brothers who nursed in my mother's breast. Then I could kiss you no matter who was watching and no one would criticize me. I would bring you to my childhood home and there you would teach me. I would give you spiced wine to drink, uh, my sweet pomegranate wine. Your left arm would be under my head and your right arm would... Uh, embrace me. Promise me, O women of Jerusalem, not to awaken love until it is until the time is right. All right. <laughs> Do you remember the Beach Boys song, Wouldn't It Be Nice? It's one of the greatest Beach Boys songs there ever was. Wouldn't it be nice if we were older and we wouldn't have to wait so long? And this is a boy singing to a girl saying, I wish we were married. I wish we could spend the whole day together and then not have to part at night. I wish that we were, we were of marrying age so we could just do this and we, would, we could be together forever. It's a wonderful song. It, it, you should look it up on YouTube. Look at the, uh, at the lyrics because there's this teenage angst of, ooh, I know what I feel and I know what I want and I want you and I want you now, but it's not possible now because we're only 17 years old. We really need to wait until we're uh, 18 and a half until after we graduated from high school or something like that. But, oh, I wish we could. Wouldn't it be nice? And in here, in this song, she says, we're in love with each other, but in our... Talk to each other. We can't be at home alone together. It's not proper. But if you were my brother, then we could go home together. And we could spend time together. And we could talk together. And I could even kiss you. Because you can kiss relatives, right? All of these things. Well, we could be so close if we were just relatives. And then she goes off. I would bring you to my childhood home. And there you would teach me. Teach me what? 
I would give you spiced wine to drink. Your left arm would be under my head. Your right arm would embrace me. At this point, we're not brother and sister anymore, right? This plan of hers wouldn't work out. There's too much desire there. And so after she says that, oh, if only, if only you were my brother, then we could do all these things together and I could kiss you and the kissing would probably go farther than what you should do with a brother and then we could uh, snuggle with each other. Oh, no. Not going to work, is it? Not going to work. And so what's the last warning? (laughs) Oh, promise me, oh, women of Jerusalem, not to wake in love until it's the right time. No matter what my plan is, it won't work. Love, desire, attraction, it's there. It's in God's plan. It's in God's heart. It just has to be held until the right time. And these two in this book, they really do love each other. And he says to her, oh, how beautiful you are. How pleasing my love. How full of delights. And she says, oh, my lover's dark and dazzling. Better than 10,000 others. They've only got eyes for each other, don't they? But somewhere along the way, somewhere along the way, even after you get married, maybe too much familiarity, maybe too much contempt for each other, too many arguments, maybe after the honeymoon is over and you find out how difficult it is and can be in a relationship to relate to each other, then you start to get tempted. You start to get tempted. But an old wise man, and this is Solomon as well, as an older, wiser man, coming back saying, let your wife be a fountain of blessing for you. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. And I think that uh, you could look at this in a polygamous society. If you're in a society where men can have many wives, like Solomon had so many wives, uh, what happens? You're 20 and she's 14, 15, you get married. And then after you've grown and had so many kids, she can't have kids anymore or, uh, or whatever, or you're wealthy enough, you're going to get another wife. And you're going to be 30 years old or 35 years old. How old is your second wife going to be? She's going to be 14 or 15 again. Okay? You always marry a girl of the same age, even though you get, keep getting older and older and older. That's why you end up with these old men marrying these very young girls. Okay? But at the end of his life, I have a feeling he was saying, you know what, I've got 300 wives and 700 concubines. I don't have time for them all. I don't know all their names. But my first love, the wife of my youth, the first one I married, who had my oldest sons, who had my first children, who went through all of these life experiences with me, guess what? Even after all these years, even maybe after her looks have faded, she's actually still my favorite. She's the one. She's the one I should have been paying more attention to all this time. So all you young men out there, even if you live in a society where you can trade women around like baseball cards, there will be one, that first one, the first wife you had, the one that you fell in love with first, she's always going to be your favorite. Spend more time with her. Think about her. Enjoy life with her. And forget all the other women out there. She's a loving deer, a graceful doe. Let her breast satisfy you always. May you always be captivated, captivated by her love. Why be captivated, my son, by an in, immoral woman or blankety-blank of a promiscuous woman? I'm not going to read those out loud. Those words I don't want to say from the pulpit. You can look it up on your own. Why do that? Why trade her in for a new one? You're going to have to start that relationship stuff all over again. Stick with the one that has been by you all these years, the one that you've shared so much of life with. You see, lust uses, but love, love commits. But there are so much out there to lust after. Uh, Just beside the computer, I think we're going to start having more ways to use pornography. There's going to be more and more ways to be involved in human trafficking. There's going to be more and more ways for us to Uh, fulfill all the desires of our flesh. This thing over here on the the right is a uh, a virtual reality glasses. I I went to hear Josh McDowell. If you don't know who that is, don't worry about it. He's a great Christian thinker and author. 
he was talking about this thing that was being invented there. It's on, it's on the market now. And, uh, I'm sure it's uh, first or second generation. He said, he said, beware of this thing. It creates virtual reality. And when you put it on, you are lost in another world. And it is so real. And he said, I have a feeling that at some point men are going to start preferring that to their actual wives. It's probably true. Because no matter what, I mean, no matter who you are, um, there's a good possibility, especially if you're very disappointed with your spouse, that you could, you can get into a, not even a real adulterous relationship, just a fantasy world with a spouse that you made up, with a, with a relationship that doesn't really exist, with a life, with a home, with an income that doesn't really exist, and you just get lost into this fantasy world, and you start missing out on the joys that is in the real world right here. Don't do that. Don't do that. God is the God of the real world, not the fantasy world. So what can I say? What can I say? Don't use people. Don't try to taste every flavor. You know, the world will tell you, experiment. Experiment with everything and everybody until you have found what pleases you most. But the fact is, promiscuity just empties you. Empties you of real joy, real relationship. In the Bible, we're taught to get to know somebody, see their character, talk, get your family involved. If your family is all saying no, stay away from that person, you probably ought to listen. In the Bible, it's all arranged marriages. You don't have to do that. Let's not do that. But let's do, bring our family and friends into bear and say, do you think this person's good for me? And if they all say no, it should be a warning sign for you. But don't try to sleep with everybody until you find out what you like. Don't live with everybody. It doesn't work out. It doesn't help. It doesn't really prepare you for marriage. At a certain point, all marriage is a risk. So take the risk. I don't know why I put these pictures up here, except that they're not looking at each other. There's something unknown. When you get married to somebody, I don't care even if you've lived with them, there's going to be something unknown. Every time you marry somebody, you're taking a risk. It doesn't have to be a high risk. Get to know them. See their character first. But you're taking a risk of getting into a relationship with somebody because you won't know everything about them. You'll find out things later on. But that discovery, that's the good stuff. That's the beauty, even if it's hard. And after you're married, there are things you can do. There are things you can do to make sure that your spouse isn't tempted to wish that they were married to somebody else. There are things you can do. Cultivate a relationship where there's openness and vulnerability in your heart, in your mind, in your spirit, even with your body. Don't withhold from your spouse. In my experience, every time you have a difficult conversation, every time you learn more, every time you're open and vulnerable more than you've ever been, you get rewarded. You don't get punished. That's just my experience. So how far will you go? In order to be completely committed, in order to put away all fantasy, all desire for another, how far are you willing to go to be more committed to your special someone? Will you get rid of the cable? Will you get rid of the internet? Will you, get, will you put a program on your, on your There's this program, there's probably several of them. There's one called Covenant Eyes where I've got it on my computer and I've got a person over here and they can log in and see my search history. They can see anything I've ever seen on the internet. Are you willing to go that far to make sure that you stay committed to your special someone and do not desire anybody else? Are you willing to give your phone to your wife? Give your little passcode word to your, uh, to your wife and say, here, take a look. Look everywhere. Read every text message. Look at it all. Are you willing to vacation somewhere else? Somewhere else, somewhere less tempting? Are you willing to alter your life and lifestyle 
so that you can stay committed to the one that you should be desiring? And are you willing to be open and vulnerable with your spouse more than you ever have been so that they will have a chance to increase in intimacy with you as well? There is a way to have wonderful, godly love between a man and a woman forever and not end up being bitter and resentful towards each other at the end. There is a way. I've seen it done. I've seen old couples in their 80s who are still in love. It's a good thing. I want to be there. How far am I willing to go to make sure it happens? That's the question. How far are you willing to go to make sure it happens? Let's be a people who value our special someone. First of all, Jesus is our special someone. Second of all, our spouse is our special someone. Whether or not we're married to them yet, they're still your special someone. They are the one you're waiting on. Wait for them. Andy Stanley, I recently heard in a sermon, he said that everywhere you are in life, everything that you're doing right now will be a story someday. This is the year 2020. It's been awful. In a few years, you're going to tell the story of how you fared during the year 2020 to somebody else. What kind of story do you want it to be? A story where you stayed aright when everything else was being tossed about? How about your single years? Are you, one of these days when you get married to somebody, they're going to say, so what were you like when, in your single years before I met you? Whew. Do you want that to be a good story or a bad story? It's all going to be a story. Make sure it's a story you're comfortable telling one of these days and not ashamed. Okay? All right, that's enough. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. You are our special someone. Help us to stay committed to you and not look to any other God any other ideology, any other safety net besides you. Help us to stay committed to who you are and have eyes, prayer, and wishes for no one else. And Lord, please help us to guard our hearts, our minds, transform our minds so that we see we have a true desire to commit to one. Just like young love, just like teenagers, just like infatuated, naive kids. Give us that strong desire to commit to one and to stay with one. And then help us to do whatever drastic thing we need. Cut off our hand, cut off our eye, cut out our eye, whatever it takes, Lord, to do it. We love you. We ask you to empower us to do these things and do them well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Good to see you this morning. Have a great afternoon. Enjoy the sunshine and the warmth. Bye.